Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to lean back so we can see the point of my hat. I want to thank Stacy Krim for this. It's supposed to be a very, I don't know, uh, Victorian witch, but we'll move on. So welcome ghouls and ghosts to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives Anniversary Speaker Series. Today is the Halloween special. My name is Beth Ann Kelsch, but more importantly, as we approach All Hallows Eve, put your hands together for your mistress of ceremonies, Carolyn Schenkel, special collections specialist. She loves a good scary tale ending and will be bewitching you with some spectral stories from UNCG's campus. So Buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a spooky afternoon. Welcome, Carolyn. What do you got for us? Tell us all about it. Woo! What an intro. I love this. What I have are the stories about our past, our signs of the past. Let's explore our campus. Has anyone here ever thought that you might not have been alone when you could not see anyone else around you? If you've ever thought that the campus was haunted, that there might be ghosts at UNCG, you might not be wrong or alone. And I love this quote by one of my favorite poets, Emily Dickinson, one not one need not be a chamber to be haunted. First, let's meet one of our most notorious ghosts on campus. And I'm gonna give her her original name back. She was originally known as the Gray Lady. She currently occupies the UNCG Auditorium. The auditorium you see here it was opened in 1927. It was renamed in 1928 for Governor Charles Brantley Aycock, but it was changed from that name in 2018. But it stands on the corner of Spring Garden and Tate Street in a very prominent spot, but it was not the first building to be located in that area. And so our gray lady, we need to step back and look to see what was there before. So now you've got an aerial view of the corner of um, Spring Garden and Tate Street. And if you can see my cursor, I'm kind of trying to circle a house that is located right there. You'll see the beginnings of what was known as the Brown Music Building further down. But we're really concerned with this building right here in this house. The woman who owned the house would let out rooms as in a boarding house. That was her income. And so there is a story about her that she became despondent. We don't know why. And she chose to go in her attic and to hang herself. Well, soon after the house was available for purchase and the college, growing rapidly at that point in time, chose to purchase that property. But the men who came to demolish her home, there were some near accidents where they, there were some near accidents where they could have been severely injured or even killed as they were demolishing that space. And they said that that area just had a bad feeling to it. But progress marches on. And we began to construct our auditorium that stands there today. And even during the construction, there were some incidents of beams falling and near misses for the workers who were working on that building. And some of them still got that bad feeling about that space. But all of that could be hearsay were it not for Raymond Taylor. Raymond Taylor was the head in different capacities of our communications and theater department spanning from 1921 to about 1960. And he, in an interview, documents one of our best occurrences of the appearances 
of the Gray Lady. And we have that article in our archives. But in here, he recounts on a stormy August night, they were working on creating the backdrops for an upcoming theater production. And he and another staff member stayed late, but it was hot, even though it was storming, they had locked the doors. And they, as he says, almost dressed down to the buff. When they finished their work, Mr. Taylor went back to put his clothes on. And he went, was a man who wore dressed nicely. And he found his watch chain in the shape of a cross. And to this day, he never knew how that came to be because there was no one else in the auditorium with them while they worked. He went on to talk about other instances where she would appear. He could hear her coming down the hall. Others have seen her up on the catwalk above the stage. And this is the backdrop that he was working on for the play. But others believe as well, we celebrate our ghost. Uh, when the building was named Acock Auditorium, she gained the moniker of Jane Acock. There was no Jane Acock. There had been a story that uh, Governor Acock had a daughter. He had no daughter named Jane. So let's give her back her original name of the Gray Lady. And you can see how much we enjoy our Gray Lady and looking for her. So she's still there. She was there after the 2008 renovation. She seemed very happy with how the improvements and is still found along in the building. But let's leave her and go to a time and a place that no longer exists on campus. But I need to introduce you to a building that's long gone. This was Brick Dormitory. It was one of the first dormitories for the students when the college opened. It stood um, right beside what we now call the Faust Building on the same site that holds our nursing building today. And if you look very closely in this photograph, if you see a little, what almost looks like a gazebo peeking over the horizon there. That's gonna become very important later in this story. And this is the dormitory where most of the students were housed and it had a dining hall attached to it at the back. In this photograph of it being under construction, if you look to the right-hand side, um, sorry, left-hand side, you will see that dining hall under construction and the back of Brick Dormitory. And this is the interior of the dining hall. All the tables set ready for the students to come to eat. And why am I gonna talk about where the students ate so much? Well, in the fall semester of 1899, a very unwelcomed visitor comes to campus. Typhoid fever struck our campus in that year. It was in the fall of 1899 that the students were having their usual illnesses, diphtheria, mumps, the flu, those were rampant amongst the student body, but then something else was happening. About 100 students took severely ill. And you can see some of the students sitting in the hospital in the infirmary, in our original infirmary that was on campus. But out of those 100 students, when the test results came back, they realized we were dealing with typhoid and that was a completely different game. That's not something that is contagious. It's something that comes in through contaminated, a contaminated water source. And November 15th, 1899, we had our first student death. Uh, we would go on to lose 13 students total and one staff member who had stayed behind to help care for those students. There were, out of that original 100, there were 48 students who were too ill to leave campus. Because in 1899, you couldn't come, you didn't have a motor vehicle to come and get you. You were either traveling by train or by horse and carriage. 
And perhaps the most widely known of those 13 students who passed away were two sisters, Evelyn and Sarah Bailey. Um, they both had come to campus at the same time. Sarah was the elder sister and Evelyn, when she came, her one request was just to be room to room with her sister. We do have the chapel attendance roster for that semester. And as you can see, they've noted that she, they died and their death dates. And this entire roster goes through and you can find all of the students' names. And Sarah and Evelyn Bailey, their mother had come to care for them. She'd come to campus to be their personal nurse and she contracted typhoid as well, but the mother survived. The two daughters, however, they both passed away. And um, here is Evelyn's obituary that mentions her sister as well. But there, what happened though, was that their father still believed so much in the purpose of the school that he served on our board of trustees. And if anybody has ever stayed or heard of Bailey uh, Residence Hall, that hall is actually named for him. The school did reopen in January 30th, 1900. This is the official report on the reopening and that they did find the source of typhoid. So that they believed that the central well used to furnish water to the tables in the dining room was the cause of the contamination. And where was this well? There's the well house. And again, we. We're always mindful of our history on campus. And you can see by this article in 1984 that we were still recognizing how the typhoid epidemic claimed 14 UNCG lives. So if you've ever wondered, because Brick Dormitory is no longer here and that original infirmary is no longer here, what building stands there now? Well, when it was demolished, it that area is now our soda shop, now the faculty center. And the campus activities board uh, used to do a paranormal weekend and they had invited some paranormal uh, specialists to come to campus. And they found the usual expected haunts. They found the, the ghost in the auditorium and they found some of the others I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. But where they were surprised to find ghost was around the soda shop but I'm not surprised at all. Those are the students who are still here on campus having their college experience. So if you ever go near the student center and you see that swing moving and nobody's on it, you don't know. And whatever happened to Brick Dormitory? Well, it caught fire in 1904 and basically burned to the ground. No one was harmed, but as you can see, the building was a complete loss. So let's move on. Let's let those college students have their fun and go see a few other sites. Now we're gonna stop at the Alumni House. The Alumni House of which we are so proud was completed in construction in 1937. And frankly, it would not have come to fruition at all were it not for one person. And that was the alumni secretary at the time. And at that point in our time, the alumni secretary wielded a tremendous amount of influence on campus because she was the main contact for all of the former students who might be willing to make donations and otherwise financially support the school. So quite a person of power. And that person is Clara Booth Bird. And here you see her in her office in the alumni house. Now, Ms. Bird was very particular about how the house was furnished because she had picked out the furnishings. She picked out all of the upholstery, all of the carpentry, um, all of the drapery, knew which doors should be left open, how things should be done. And she was extremely meticulous about it. And she was what we would call a force of nature. So there are those who think that she is, she is still in her house. And we have this wonderful email sent to us talking about the ghost about in the house and how certain doors do need to stay open and certain doors don't and how the certain lights come on or off. 
and we think that she's there keeping watch. So we'll let her keep watch and we're gonna go to another site along our path. We're gonna visit Jackson Library. And this is photo is from the early 1970s showing you the north side of the library. This is the side that would face the rock um, for those who are familiar with campus or face the fountain. And there are rumors that there might be a ghost in the library. There's some truth because the library did have a tragedy very early on. And there's the rumors are not rumors. There was a student named Kenneth Crump, and I would just like to verbally acknowledge my colleague, Stacy Krim, who did some wonderful research on this incident. Um, Kenneth Crump committed suicide by jumping from the ninth floor of the library tower. He did not feel at all comfortable or safe in his dormitory. And when that would happen, he would hide in the library. We weren't open 24 hours a day, like for certain days, like we are now. So he would just kind of hide out and then come out later to find somewhere where he could rest. And that's what he did that particular night. The janitor who was working that night saw him earlier in the evening, said hello. Um, evidently was not an unusual in surprise to find Kenneth in the building. It seemed to be those who understood his situation and let him stay. Um, but later in the evening when the janitor went up to the ninth floor, he found the windows on the ninth floor that faced the Elliott University Center smashed and he looked below and saw Kenneth's body. And I came to campus within 10 years of this incident happening and I still remember people how much this reverberated through the campus community. There's not a physical memorial to Kenneth anywhere on campus, except if you were to look at the windows on the uh, Jackson Library Tower, you would notice these wooden bars across them. Those were installed afterwards. And the other image you see on my on my screen, we have a bullet, we have a whiteboard downstairs where people are writing their favorite things about the library. And as evidenced, there, are, there is the belief that there is a ghost in the library. Somebody thinks it's on the seventh floor, somebody wishes to disagree and say it's on the second floor. And also a shout out to Six Tech. But now we're gonna go a little further down College Avenue and we're gonna meet Annabelle and the lady in blue. So North Spencer Residence Hall is a curious architectural um, anomaly. It is a residence hall that's tremendously long. It was built in 1904 to replace the brick dormitory. So when the brick dormitory caught fire and everyone got out, Dr. McKeever was so concerned that should another fire break out in the residence hall, um, he did not want anything built higher than two stories. So for those of you who've been on campus and looked at the Spencer Residence Hall and wondered why is it so long and so short, there you go. So our next story happens here. And here are some early st students in the dorm having a great time. So this is back in the day. But they say that Spencer's haunted and the students have given her a name, Annabelle. And they even say there's a particular room that she likes to occupy. And it's one of, and it's the room right here at the tower um, and that she will make herself known. Other students have recounted on this upper level being walking, walking down the hall and suddenly a cold rush of air will come along and a blue mist will manifest in the outline of a female form. And that's how we get the blue lady. But there's other instances too. Uh, we have an account of a, two individuals who were staying in the dorm while it was being renovated and the fire alarms had to be taken off the system. So they were having to do fire watches and walk through the buildings and that there would be music playing in the parlor when there was nobody there. 
as we keep going down College Avenue. Let's go to our most celebrated ghost. But she might be misidentified, and perhaps that's why she's so persistent. We're going to go look at Mary Faust Residence Hall. Mary Faust and Guilford Dormitory were both constructed at the same time. They were both opened in 1928, and they mirror each other on either side of College Avenue. But Mary Faust Residence Hall was named for a specific student who had graduated in 1920 and just happened to be the daughter of the current president of the school, Julius Faust. And here is Mary Faust's wonderful senior portrait and a little bit about her. Um, she was originally supposed to be in the class of 1919, but as this indicates, due to illness, she did not. She had to uh, delay her classes. But she was well liked. She participated in a lot of activities. Um, after her graduation, she met a man, John Armstrong, and, and soon they married. And in 1925, they were expecting to have their first child. Well, that turned out to be their only child because Mary Faust died during childbirth. It was soon after that the building plans for the dormitory were announced and there was a vote of what to name these two new dormitories. And so it was thought to name one of them in honor of her because she had epitomized what the students should be like. But is it really her that walks those halls? and causes the crying sounds that students hear, or turns off the lights, or makes loud noises. And if it was her, why would, her, why would she take down her portrait that hangs in the building? And why would it get spirited away in the 1950s and that portrait never found again? The portrait that currently hangs is a replacement and it's firmly attached to the wall because it started to fall as well. There was a student in 1937 who had gone up onto the back, the roof of the back patio of um, Mary Faust to sunbathe. This was a common occurrence in the 1930s. The students would go up there to sunbathe where they were out of sight of any male faculty, staff, or visitors. And they would often put a ladder against the side of the roof to go up there, not the roof of the, of the dormitory, but the roof of the back patio where it was flat. Well, on May 16th, 1937, one of those students who was sunbathing slipped off the ladder and fell. She, her head hit the concrete below, she lost consciousness, she was taken to the hospital and passed away later that evening. And her picture is amongst those that you see here in that freshman class of 1937. Now there was a fire in the Mary Faust Residence Hall in 1956, but if you just peek over the shoulder of that man that's facing us, you can see that flat roof where those girls would have sunbathed. And I'm not sure what caused that fire, but I think that's a little suspicious that it started in that room right there. So is the ghost Mary Faust? or is the ghost the student? But there's definitely been some paranormal activity. Um, we've got articles about it, even 20 years ago, they talk about how the, they, the lights would flicker and the loud noises. And here at UNCG, we love all of our ghosts. We celebrate them. As noted by all the articles you've seen, and by these, we really honor our ghost and enjoy telling their stories because it gives us the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the history of the school. If you've ever experienced a paranormal event on campus, let us know. And if anybody recognizes that image on the lower corner, that is the death mask of Dr. Charles Duncan McKeever. Can you show off your... Uh... Absolutely. Wearing, there we go. You know what I'm talking about. I know. And when I stop sharing a screen, you'll see it better. So with gratitude, 
I just want to list the people who've helped collect these stories and share these stories. And this is my lovely necklace that Beth Ann was mentioning um, a few years back. The 3D scanner downstairs on our DMC, they scanned McKeever's death mask and then used the 3D printer to print what you see here, which is my um, necklace. It's scary. I'm never going to leave my office again, so <laughs> that's going to be tough with I'll have to, the bathroom issue might be something I have to figure out. But um, are there any questions or comments for Carolyn or are you done? I may, did I cut you off? You didn't cut me off at all, but um, do, you I could not do you believe, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I couldn't read the chat while I was talking, so I'm going to just scroll through the chat. Okay. Do you believe in these ghosts and all of them? So I, I do believe in the auditorium ghosts. I was giving this tour to a group of students in August of one year. It was incredibly hot, just one of those blistering North Carolina summer days. And we were standing there in that afternoon, trying to stay in the huddled in the shade. And all of a sudden, as I was talking about her, this cold burst of air shot through the crowd. And we all stopped breathing. And all of us just in unison just turned to look at the auditorium and there was a light in one of the upper windows that kept flickering on and off. And I thought, okay, she's listening. She's definitely in there. Okay, did you say nice things about her? Oh, I always do. Okay. I do. Right. Be respectful of our ghosts. Okay, good. Um, that's a, probably a, a safe way to play it. Does anyone have any questions, comments? You have to, if you want my hat, you'll have to ask Stacy. it's not mine. Are you all more scared than you were before? Now you're gonna look around the library. I do have one myth I want to dispel and that's the one of how some people think that the um, Jackson Library ghost is manifesting. So I've heard students say that they go up in the tower and they'll see books shelved backwards. That's that's not Kenneth. That that are the, that's the students who are learning how to shelve books who are working for access services. Um, we have had an instance of someone feeling like they were falling backwards and where they should not have been able to stop falling and then feeling like they were gently put back on their feet. We don't know. So I don't know, uh, and she's not Mrs. Bird, she's Miss Bird. She's, um, <laughs> she, she chose to never marry. So I don't know. I don't know what she thinks of the new arrangements in um, the alumni house. I have not heard. Uh, one staff member who would know a lot does not believe in ghosts and there's another staff member who does and thinks that she's still in there oh she's not going to get you for that yeah in the alumni house work yeah in the alumni just, house yeah. yeah 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 so team skeptical uh, <laughs> and team believey team belief i think we can i think we coexist i think there's forces that we coexist with okay team Mulder. yeah 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 okay <laughs> She's probably not a fan. Ha! That's Sean. Yes, Miss Bird is like, wait a minute, I decorated this perfectly. What's going on here? Okay, fine point. Fine point, Sean. Uh, okay, I'm going to give a few more seconds for questions or comments. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to thank Carolyn for her spooky, spooky, spooky stories of campus. Um, oh, do we have haunted objects and special collections? Mm. Not yet. Well, we have danger side. Yeah, dangerous, but not necessarily haunted. I guess we need to get on. Uh, get on that. Creepy dolls. All <laughs> dolls are creepy. Do we have puppets? All puppets are creepy. Clowns. So define creepy. 
of the Nia, does the cut, I don't even know what that is. Carolyn? Um, no, but we have other works. Okay. We do have a, a, a lot of good, like Dracula, right? We've got Dracula, we've got early works on witchcraft and demonology. Um, I'll be putting up a pop-up exhibit for that next week. I'll let y'all know. Okay, well, great. Um, good to know about your opinions of puppets. Yeah, I, that's, we don't need to talk about me. Yes, puppets. <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you everyone for attending. Thank you again, Carolyn. Uh, happy Halloween season, and we will talk to you soon. All right.